Okay, um, as promised, 11.02. Um, I appreciate there are still people coming in, but they're only going to miss my opening, so uh, that's not so important. Um, can I firstly welcome you as always to the latest in the Cornerstone uh, Barristers Housing Team uh, webinar uh, programme for 2021. Uh, we're dealing with possession, uh, sorry, public sector quality duty, just to, uh, just to worry you, uh, and residential possession claims. Uh, and it's a subject, of course, you may have been lucky enough to uh, attend either a course last year that was done on homelessness in the PSED, where um, five members of Chambers dealt with that. And indeed, uh, Emma, Ryan, Rucci and myself dealt with one last year on this same subject as well, although, as we'll see, uh, things have moved on uh, since then. Uh, this is, as I say, part of the series we're dealing with um, a whole range of housing issues. Some of you may have seen uh, one that we did in June of this year, where Tara, Olivia, um, Christina and Rowan dealt with possession proceedings, where are we now? Uh, and indeed, the next one is on the 2nd of November 2021, where Kuljit, Alex and Rowan, as far as I know anyway, uh, are dealing with the question of antisocial behaviour, closure orders and community protection notices. And lastly, uh, in terms of the plugs, um, please note that Housing Week starts on the 11th of October uh, and we're doing a webinar a day for that uh, week. So you'll be getting details of that, if not already, very shortly. Uh, in terms of today, I'm going to be starting off, you see me unfortunately on the right, uh, and then uh, Rucci uh, will be taking over from me, uh, followed by Ryan uh, uh, finishing off. Uh, we're all people who have been involved in cases involving the public sector quality duty, including in uh, possession claims, so hopefully you'll find this informative. Uh, and an obvious starting point, of course, is the uh, Section 149 provision itself, which doesn't uh, sit there in its entirety, uh, but the public sector equality duty, which has predecessors in other legislation, such as the Sex Discrimination Act and the Race Relations Act, um, is, as you can see, really set out at section 149 of the Equality Act 2010. It's particularly subparagraph one, and there are those three strands of it. Now, of course, they may not apply in every case, uh, although, uh, as Ruchi will discuss when she talks about the problems with pleadings, um, it's very rare for defences to pick out what they're complaining about. Are they complaining about a failure to have due regard to eliminate discrimination, to advance a quality of opportunity, uh, to foster good relations? Um, uh, and she'll be dealing with those issues. But that is what the duty is. And one of the crucial things you'll see there is from the first sentence, which has been put in pink, which says, of course, the duty is to have due regard. Uh, and as we'll see throughout this webinar, it's not a duty to achieve a result. It's to have due regard. It also follows from that is that it's very different, although there is an overlap of sorts with discrimination and the question of proportionality. And it also follows uh, in a sense that it's not something which if you breach, you're liable in damages, where of course, if you discriminated against a tenant, for example, you could be liable in damages. Uh, so section 40149 uh, sets out those uh, possible three requirements. Uh, and of course, that applies, if we have a look at the next slide, to people who have a protected characteristic. Now, what you'll see as we go through uh, this webinar is that the main one that we're talking about is disability. But there's no reason why it can't be any of the others that you see there in front of you. Uh, and of course, that would mean that somebody would, uh, for example, an officer considering whether to issue a warrant or an officer considering whether to issue proceedings or to uh, serve a notice seeking possession or a notice to quit, would have to consider uh, a, a relevant protected characteristic, whether it's disability or age or sex or religion or belief and so on. Uh, so there are uh, those protected characteristics, although, as I say, uh, case law has suggested that it's disability that particularly is pleaded in defences uh, and is raised, although I have, as I'm sure the other two have, come across other protected characteristics. Um, looking at the next slide, um, what we see uh, in relation to uh, this matter is, is that it's heavily litigated, which is great for us. Uh, and great for our bank balance, but unfortunately it's not always very impressive for people who are having to uh, fund such actions, particularly if the uh, claimed breach of the public sector quality duty 
is um, hopeless. Now, you have a series of cases there. Uh, and what I would say about those very briefly, because they'll come up as we go throughout this seminar. Uh, the Taylor and Slough case is one of Rucci's cases, so I'll probably now get it wrong and you'll see maybe Rucci later squirm. Um, but it's an absolute ground case uh, where there was a secure tenancy uh, and the tenant in that case lost the appeal against the possession order uh, and it was found that there was subsequent compliance. It's worth reading because it is one of the more recent cases uh, and is helpful in that respect, but also worth reading to show the nature of the opposition. And as you might imagine, in an absolute ground case, the public sector of quality duty acquires a greater uh, role where otherwise there may be no other defence, where, of course, in a discretionary ground case, you're going to be dealing with questions of reasonableness in any event. Uh, Hertfordshire and Davis uh, is um, not the main case that I did with Tara uh, in, in this matter for Hertfordshire, but there was a, a challenge to the permission to issue a writ of possession, having got up to the Court of Appeal and back. Uh, and there was a complaint, there was a procedural uh, problem with that. Uh, but uh, as an add-on, uh, I think it's fair to say there was an attempt to introduce the public sector equality duty and it didn't get off the ground. Uh, Luton and Dadana is a case which concerns ground 17 of the 88 Act Schedule 2. Uh, it's a misrepresentation case, therefore, and it's a case which I think was before Her Honour Judge Bloom at first instance, uh, went to the Court of Appeal, um, the Housing Association did succeed at the Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court are in the process of considering a permission to appeal application from the tenant. Um, but it was, as I say, a discretionary ground case, and it was a question of whether it was highly likely that the result would have been the same if there hadn't been a breach of the public sector quality duty where they had in that case. Team and Metropolitan, uh, I won't say much about because we're in the Court of Appeal on this, myself and, and my junior, um, Liam um, uh, Farnham from Fenner's Chambers. Um, we're in a, a, court, a Court of Appeal on this on the 3rd or 4th of November. Uh, suffice to say, the two issues really being raised there, which will come up later in this webinar, are, are firstly the availability of retrospective compliance with the public sector quality duty and the question of whether it made any difference anyway, such that a breach doesn't have the effect of stopping the possession claim. Both of those issues Ryan will be dealing with at the end of the seminar. Uh, Forward and Oldwick was a breach, a, uh, was an accepted breach of the public sector of quality duty, and again was a highly likely case. In other words, uh, the tenant was unsuccessful in arguing it made any difference at all, uh, and therefore didn't succeed at the Court of Appeal. Uh, London and Quadrant and Patrick, if you are going to read any case, um, I think this is the case that still is useful to read. Uh, it does set out very neatly the different issues uh, that are relevant to the question of the public sector quality duty. And from recollection, and I'll be uh, corrected if I'm wrong, I think it was paragraph 42 in particular uh, of Mr Justice Turner's judgment uh, that said that, but we'll be dealing with that later on. And lastly, but of course not least, Rucci and I dealt with the case of uh, Powell and Decorum Borough Council, uh, where we didn't have to do much. Um, it was, um, uh, <laughs> it was a, an attempt um, to argue uh, questions of public law, um, but in essence, um, uh, it's in relation to a stay of the execution of a warrant for possession, in essence it didn't get um, very far. Um, and uh, uh, it was an important case for reasons which I won't spoil, the next presenters um, uh, talk on why power was important, but it was important uh, because of a contextual issue. So those are the kind of cases that we've had. Uh, and um, uh, what I really want to make clear is, is that for those of you who have faced these kind of uh, applications uh, and, and these defences, uh, and indeed the skeleton arguments that thereafter follow, you'll find a lot of cutting and pasting, and a lot of that cutting and pasting that takes place involves the case of bracking. Now, bracking is, is a, a, an interesting case in many respects. Um, it was uh, to do with the challenge to the closure of the Independent Living Fund, um, and therefore concerned issues of national policy. It's also important, as will be seen later, that Lord Justice McComb, who set out some basic principles of paragraph 25, was also in power and decorum. Um, uh, and therefore it's important to see from that point of view. But it's also cited, as I say, again and again by defendant lawyers as indicating that 
These are the proper approaches to the PSED and woe betide anyone who doesn't comply with them. Uh, what we'll see by the end of uh, this session is that it's not quite as simple as that. None of that is to undermine the public sector quality duty, which is an incredibly important duty and where possible should be complied with. And I think it's always important to set that as the basic approach. One should try and comply with it. One should try and consider whether somebody's disabilities have impacted upon their behaviour or whether they would be particularly uh, in difficulty were they to be homeless and so on or whatever other protected characteristic. But it doesn't always mean that it represents a defence. And you'll see from uh, a few ideas, uh, sorry, a few ideas, a few principles that Lord Justice McCoom, I'm sure there are more than ideas, um, although he's retired now, so maybe not, doesn't matter so much, um, uh, that uh, the decision maker must be aware of the PACD. Well, I think what we often say in housing is, is that a good housing officer who is just dealing with a case fairly and conscientiously will probably comply with it in any event. Uh, and there is good dicta uh, elsewhere to suggest that it is possible to comply with the PSED, even if you've never heard of it or haven't got round to reading section 149 um, uh, of the Equality Act 2010. There has to be a proper and conscientious focus on the statutory criteria, not a tick box exercise, not a standard form of words in a homelessness review decision, uh, but a proper look at the statutory criteria and whether they apply and if they apply what impact if any that would have on the decision making of the public body or the body exercising a public function uh, it's helpful obviously to know that you've actually can show that you've complied with it now that doesn't mean you have to do a um, uh, an assessment for every decision you make but if there is a clear um, uh, record of your decision making to show that yes we did contact the GP we did have a chat with a mental health nurse we did try to bring together a number of agencies, that kind of thing may of course help. And it's something for you to do. It's not something, when I say you, of course, I mean the public body or the body exercising a public function. Um, and therefore you can't delegate that. Uh, and it should be complied ideally in advance. Uh, and, and obviously all I would say at this point, because Ryan will deal with this, is that um, it probably isn't a problem if it's not, but you should certainly aim to deal with it in advance. And lastly, and I think I haven't overrun my time, which is quite impressive for me, um, I have just put a picture of a judge in a funny outfit. Um, uh, what um, I uh, wanted to say from Patrick, not only is Patrick um, an incredibly important case and a very helpful case if you wanted to get a feel for public sector quality duty issues, it's just what is actually said by uh, Mr Justice Turner in that case, where he said issues concerning the parameters and content of the PSED and its statutory predecessors have given rise to a plethora of decided cases, and we've seen some of those, the abundance of which is at least in part attributable to the elusively broad terms in which it has been cast. Uh, and all he's really saying there is, is that when one's looking at the question of due regard, it is very difficult to be precise. It's very difficult to say to a housing officer, for example, you must do X, Y, and Z. You can certainly suggest things that would be helpful, suggest things that would, would comply, but one can always think of other things. And therefore it's, it's difficult to ever say, I can 100% uh, uh, with 100 certainty say that I have complied. Uh, but certainly what you can do is make sure you're alive to the issues and you're alive to their potential impact on the decisions that you're having to make. As I say, whether issuing a notice, issuing proceedings, uh, deciding to go for an absolute ground rather than a discretionary ground, going for a warrant or whatever that decision is. Uh, but it's not, as I say, a very clear process, uh, although hopefully by the end of uh, this morning, you'll get a better idea of what you need to do and what the law is. So stopping there, you'll be glad to hear, I'm going to pass on to Rucci, uh, who is going to go on to deal with uh, further issues concerning the application of the PSED. So Rucci. Thanks, Andy. Um, so, yes, I'm going to pick up from uh, where Andy left off and um, fair to say that Andy's obviously presented a very neat picture of what the various cases say. And in some respects, one would think that that's sort of the end of the matter. But the reality is um, that the BSED remains a somewhat difficult and um, 
you know, troubling issue for both landlords and tenants, not with, notwithstanding the very large number of um, appeals and indeed um, court decisions that Andy's run through already, um, including, as you, as you have noted, a large number of them were from the Court of Appeal and they're all fairly recent. So um, the first thing I want to look at is why the BSED is still causing such an issue. And the easy answer, perhaps, is that the BSED, as Andy mentioned, is commonly pleaded as a defence to possession proceedings. Um, and indeed, it's a point that is often pursued further in appeals um, up to the High Court and Court of Appeal. Now, um, on the pleadings point, and in my experience at least, um, it's quite interesting because the BSED is often included as sort of the last or final throwaway point that's always pleaded in the alternative. And it's only when you get to the trial or indeed even the appeal in some of my cases that it takes on a much larger significance because none of the other points are sort of made out on the factual evidence, etc. And then similarly, also on the pleadings point, um, and again, this I feel like I'm repeating Andy a lot, but um, the pleadings are not are not properly particularized. So Andy mentioned at the outset what the three equality aims were of this of section 149. And um, the duty is to have due regard to one or more of those equality objectives. Um, so it's actually quite a specific duty, but when it comes to pleadings and defenses, it's never really said what um, an officer may have failed to do. Um, all they'll, you know, all is all that is usually said is that there's been a failure to properly discharge the BSED. Now that doesn't actually mean anything, and often it's not until you get to the trial, or you know, in fact, closing submissions in the trial, or indeed the appeal, that um, you really get uh, a proper sense um, of what it is said, uh, you know, what is said to be the breach in any given case. Um, so. So there's, so there's the litigation problem, as I say, with pleadings and the fact that these um, cases tend to be appealed or this issue tends to be appealed a lot. But I think that rather begs the question. And so um, I think speaking um, sort of, again, from my experience, there are probably three other reasons why um, the BSED is really causing such an issue. And they're all really linked to the very heart of what the BSED is all about. So um, firstly, the, the very concept, I mean, you know, it's not something that can be explained with scientific certainty, and um, I'll come on to this in due course, but due regard is very open-ended. It um, inevitably opens itself up to highly subjective interpretations of what is, you know, due in any situation or on certain facts, and this inevitably leads to arguments in court. Um, the second um, difficulty then is around um, difficulties with evidence. So um, there's two elements to this. Firstly, the difficulties in actually obtaining evidence in the first place. Um, now, as Andy mentioned, a bunch, you know, the majority of these cases, I think pretty much all these cases that he mentioned were to do with um, the protected characteristic of disability. So um, tenants are vulnerable and they may be highly vulnerable, which pose real issues in terms of communication and engagement. Um, so in many cases, uh, a, you know, an officer is simply in the dark as to what the relevant protected characteristic might be. Um, that being said, I probably should flag here that if there are any red flags or if there's sort of, you know, if there's anything in sort of your um, uh, communication or lack of communication with the tenant that makes you feel that there might be underlying issues here, there is a duty on you to make reasonable inquiries. So, um, you know, do bear that in mind. Um, and in a given case, if you're not hearing anything back from the tenant, you may, for example, just want to reach out and check with um, local support groups or, um, you know, mental health practitioners in the area to just see if the tenant is known to them. Now, uh, the second aspect of this, um, you know, of the evidence issue is the fact that evidence is often changing or last, you know, always produced last minute. And that's something that I've dealt with quite a lot in the cases that I've had. So what tends to happen is that tenants, um, you know, 
understandably often, will not get legal advice until the last possible second. So that will be before the first hearing, or in fact, in many cases, it will be you know, the day before the trial. And it's only when that process is sort of um, kicked off that you will suddenly come to court all prepared for a trial. And um, you know, only the night before you'll have been served a sort of a, a, a letter from a GP saying that so-and-so has, has been suffering with all these issues um, for a very long time. And that um, you know, if they're made home, um, homeless or if the eviction goes through, they will have particularly particular difficulties dealing with that, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's something that throws a sort of, um, you know, a curveball, because um, as you will all hopefully be familiar, the PSED is a continuing duty. So just because you've considered it once at the start of proceedings doesn't mean it stands sort of, you know, your assessment does not stand still in time. And there is an obligation on you to reconsider where relevant new evidence changes the picture that you previously, um, you know, believed it to be. Um, Right, so that's the second issue. And then um, coming on to the third one, and I appreciate only now that the you know the slide is in slightly different order than I thought it was going to be, but in any event, I'll um, proceed with you know my order. Um, the third issue is this confusion with proportionality and discrimination in general. Um, Again, or you know, as housing practitioners, no doubt you'll be familiar with the general proportionality assessment, which is the last stage that you come on to when you're dealing with uh, a defense based on uh, discrimination. And again, you'll be familiar that proportionality is really an exercise where you sit down and ask yourself whether, well, firstly, whether there's a sort of a legitimate objective in pursuing the eviction. eviction. And if, uh, if there is, then, you know, is the eviction the least, um, sort of intrusive way of achieving that objective or are there some lesser means that you can um, uh, undertake to, to achieve that same objective? Um, and then you, you then come on to carrying out an overall balancing exercise, you know, to see whether it's, it's in all the circumstances if it's fair to proceed with the eviction. Um, now, while many of these considerations overlap with uh, what you need to do when you're having due regard in the PSED sense, they are not one and the same thing. So it's not, they're not completely interchangeable concepts. And that is um, one, you know, sort of one uh, point on which some uh, people tend to make an error because the PSED is just, it's not simply, um, uh, it, it, can't, it can't simply duplicate what you've done for a proportionality exercise. And it is a bit more focused because what you need to do as part of the PSED is actually consider the impact of your decision. Um, so in this case, to, you know, to commence eviction proceedings against the rel relevant equality aim in the PSED. So one of the three aims that Andy flagged at the start. Um, and usually um, it will be limb B, which is about um, fostering equality of opportunity between those who, um, you know, share protected characteristic and those who don't. Um, so it's about taking into account how this will impact on a person with this disability and whether there's anything in your decision making process that you can do to um, aid with that element of that person's, um, uh, you know, of, of that disability effectively. So having sort of set out that it is all um, still quite uh, stressful <laughs> and there's lots of uh, question marks and sort of errors in how people go about the BSED, um, our very firm advice is that um, you shouldn't panic because the BSED is not some horribly complex beast uh, and properly understood, it should involve a fairly straightforward exercise and the starting point to understanding how the BSED should be properly discharged is really to look at its purpose. Um, and Andy touched on this um, slightly at the start, but um, I will just re-emphasize, you know, that while it's um, it can seem to be quite annoying because it keeps coming up in appeals, um, you know, when officers are just trying to go about their jobs very conscientiously, the reality is that the, the aim of the BSED and indeed predecessor to the BSED, which was in various, um, you know, uh, individual legislations dealing with race and disability, etc., is that that aim is quite an important one. And it is really about the about embedding equality considerations across all public decision making so as to actually counter and, you know, at the decision making stage itself, um, counter 
any inequalities that might arise because of certain protected characteristics such as race or disability or gender. So it is very important, um, but that does not mean that it trumps everything else. Um, and I just want to unpack that a bit in terms of, you know, what really the PSED is all about. And there's three things that I want to um, sort of take away from um, the, the, the purpose of the BSED. So um, the first aspect is to bear in mind, as I've said, that the BSED is about process um, and the decision-making process. Um, it is only one part of your decision-making process and it absolutely does not trump all other considerations. Now, second and related to that, it is not what is a so-called target duty. So it's not about achieving a specific outcome in any given case. Um, it is really just about making sure that you've thought through the implications from a BSED perspective when you're coming up with, you know, when you're coming to your decision of taking um, X and Y's step, whether that's um, the issuing of a notice or indeed commencing proceedings. Um, it, just because an individual has a protected characteristic, um, it does not mean that you can't actually commence procession proceedings. It just means that you need to think about it. Um, so as I say, it's not a it's not about a it's not about the result, it's just about the process. And then the third point on this that I just want to stress is that um, the courts have confirmed that substance will trump form when it comes to the BSED. So where you have sat down and conscientiously thought about a tenant's disability and how that might affect your decision making process that um, will, in cases particularly where it's been properly evidenced, that will override any generic form filling or, you know, box ticking exercise. Um, and I think this is a point that was um, that was made quite clear and sort of re-emphasized by the courts in uh, the Slough, Borough Council and Taylor decision that Andy referred to. Um, so in that decision, um, well, there are several issues and I'm, I'm sure Ryan's going to touch on, well, well, might touch on um, one of them. But in terms of substance of reform, one of the interesting things that came out of that decision was that the officer in that case had um, mistakenly filled out um, a sort of PSED form, you know, a pro forma form on the wrong basis and had ticked the box that said that the tenant did not have a disability when it was clear that the tenant did have a disability. So this took on, um, you know, quite an important uh, role in the, in, in the arguments on the other side, where it was alleged that the officer had not had proper consideration of um, the, the BSED. Um, but that was dismissed both in the High Court um, well, both in the county court and the high court. And the reason was because when you sat down and actually looked at the, the other contemporaneous evidence in the case, it was abundantly clear that the officer had conscientiously looked and considered these issues, looked at and considered these issues. So, for example, there were email records where it was um, seen that the officer um, had made all these inquiries of, um, you know, local support agencies, et cetera, to try and ascertain whether the tenant was known to them because she hadn't had, you know, she wasn't getting any responses from the tenant at that time. There was also evidence to show that she had actually, um, uh, as soon as she'd seen the medical report of the tenant's disability, she had started making inquiries about whether there was uh, any way that the tenant could be moved to supported living accommodation. Um, and indeed, in the year that all of this was going on, all the antisocial behaviour and um, sort of the flat being used for drug use, etc., she had actually made um, two or three visits to the tenant at home to try and, you know, talk through all the issues to see what other support she could provide and indeed um, sort of to explain the consequences of, um, you know, behaviour not changing. Um, and so when you look at when the court considered all that evidence in the round, it was clear that the duty had been complied with in substance. And it didn't really matter if a form had been filled out on the wrong basis, because it's not about, as I say, a box ticking exercise. And this brings me back to the point that Andy's already made, where um, which is actually that if you, you know, if with most officers, where you have conscientiously just done your job the way you, you, you're sort of you know, trained to do and the way you no doubt do, um, that in most cases will automatically have the effect of uh, discharging the PSED as well, even if you haven't thought about it in those terms. Although obviously um, it is advisable to you know, give that training at the outset and to make sure that um, officers do know 
of what they need to be doing in any given case where there are issues um, raising protected characteristics or individuals with protected characteristics. So coming on then to um, the concept of due regard, and I just I did mention this and um, uh, that I would come back to this. Um, this, as I say, this is, you know, this is not an exact science. Um, what is required will just ultimately depend from case to case and it will differ from case to case. And I think that's one of the reasons why this issue is, you know, this, the PSED is litigated so much because it, it does involve uh, sometimes subjective judgments and um, individuals will, you know, tenants will disagree and indeed tenants lawyers will disagree with what an officer considers to be due in any given situation. Um, that being said, I just want to um, emphasize here that, uh, and this is sometimes does cause confusion in practice, I think, but the courts have confirmed that when you are looking at the issue of, um, for example, disability, um, what will be due in any given situation will be affected by what else is going on in the case. So not only are you entitled, but in fact, you're required to take into account all the countervailing or you know, competing factors in your case. So on the one hand, you'll be looking at the um, protected characteristics, to say it's disability, and you'll be thinking about how your decision affects sort of the aim to foster equality of relationship, uh, equality of opportunity, sorry. Um, but on the other hand, you are very much entitled and mandated to use um, in the balance sort of what else is going on. So, you know, how are neighbours being affected? How long has this activity been going on? What other steps have you taken? And to that extent, at least, um, there is an obvious overlap with the proportionality exercise, which is why, um, you know, officers will usually do all of this together, sort of the proportional, proportionality element and the PSED. And, um, as I say, there are cl clear overlaps, but as I've also mentioned, um, they are two different questions. So just be careful not to entirely conflate the issues. Um, and it is re it is often helpful to sort of re record separately, even if it's on the same form or um, same document that that you know you've had consideration of the um, BSED as well. Um, linked to this concept of you know what is due regard is the um, is the sort of overarching factor, I would say, and perhaps this is the key thing that's come out of the recent, you know, all the recent cases that Andy mentioned, is that the BSED is an entirely fact sensitive and um, context specific exercise. Um, now, again, a lot of cases have talked about this, um, but just picking up uh, perhaps on the uh, Patrick case, um, which Andy mentioned, <coughs> was the one case that you should read if you're not going to read any of the others, uh, because it helpfully summarizes all of the other principles um, that have been uh, gained from the other cases. But what I will just say about Patrick is um, the facts of that are you know, quite interesting on this sort of fact sensitive subject and what is due regard in any given case. Um, so in that case, uh, you know, there was no mention of the of any disability previously, um, and indeed there was nothing to suggest that the officer needed to make inquiries in that case. But what happened was that I think a day and a half um, before the hearing, for the first time ever, um, the tenant adduced all this evidence of a disability. But, um, you know, the local authority officers considered this and pressed ahead with the hearing. And it was only then on appeal that it was effectively argued that, you know, um, given that they had this new evidence, they should have, uh, uh, well, you know, sat down and uh, had properly considered the PSED and properly considered where they should uh, proceed with the proceedings. Um, and there's interesting commentary on this in the judgment of Patrick from um, Mr. Justice Dana, because what she sets out really is, is the fact that what is due in any given situation will be fact sensitive. So where you've got new evidence at the 11th hour, um, you can't expect, or, or officers are not expected to discharge the PSED in the same way that they might have done if this evidence was available to them at the start of the whole process, say prior to um, issuing proceedings. So, you know, the facts of any given situation will impact on how you choose to discharge the PSED. And in this specific case, um, the, the judge accepted effectively that it was enough for the officer to just review this evidence and, you know, make a decision themselves to just proceed rather than sitting down, filling out another form or filling out another document saying that that's what they had done. 
Um, and then a, just a final note on this slide is that once you have considered the BSED, a court is not going to intervene on the subject of or the question of how much weight you give to the duty. So that the matter of how you balance the PSED into your overall decision making process as to what you effectively do, i.e. whether you continue possession proceedings or not, that will be a question for you. All a court will do is to, is to assess whether you have considered the PSED in the first place. They won't interfere to say, well, actually, in this case, you should have given it more weight or not. And so to the extent that um, that's what the defendant is arguing in any given case, that's something that can be easily dismissed. And um, given that Andy um, talked about bracking um, and sort of tying the thread together with everything that I've said, um, what has been really helpful um, in terms of counter, um, you know, countering um, all the pleadings that have copy and paste, you know, from the judgment of bracking is that the judge, uh, Lord Justice McComb, who gave the leading judgment in bracking, actually also gave the leading judgment in the Powell decision that Andy mentioned that we were both in. Um, and um, very helpfully, he himself said that um, lawyers need to stop reading bracking as though firstly, it's, you know, it's part of the statute books and indeed to simply um, apply the bracking principles to cases where they're just simply not relevant because the reality is, um, as I've said four or five times now, this is all fact specific. And just because um, you know, a macro policy decision will require all the things that Bracking said it required, doesn't mean that the same considerations applied in the individual cases of, um, you know, that local housing uh, officers need to make in any given case. Um, so on that note then, um, I will pass over to Ryan to discuss the implications um, really of what happens if you get it wrong the first time round. Thanks very much, Rucci. And I think the overall message to derive um, from Rucci's contribution is that it really is about substance over form. But what I might encourage you to all think about is, well, it can't hurt but to have the form in place for the purposes of an audit trail. So um, before we get to the stage of retrospective compliance, in order to encourage um, your clients to get it right in the first instance, it's not a bad idea to have a pro forma that demonstrates you've had regard to the public sector equality duty and properly considered um, Equality Act considerations. And indeed, central government, when they are introducing or amending legislation, have a procedure they go through in every case where they think about the equality impacts of any individual piece of legislation. So similarly, what I suggest is that as a social housing landlord, you have a pro forma, you have a procedure um, that is all about the equality impacts of a particular decision, whether that be um, instituting the proceedings for possession or serving a notice or um, claiming a, an injunction. Whatever the step is, there ought to be a form um, which uh, you as a lawyer and your client as the housing officer sit together and fill out that demonstrates for the court that you have had regard to the necessary factors within section 149 of the Equality Act. And it, it's a good discipline because it forces you to apply all those steps that you've been doing anyway as an excellent housing officer, but to set it out in a single document that you can then rely upon before the court when there is the inevitable challenge um, saying that you haven't complied with the public sector quality duty. So, Absolutely right. We're all about substance, but it can't hurt to have the form um, just so that you've got an audit trail of your decision making and, and so that it's much easier for us as lawyers when we're representing um, your position at court. Now, I feel a little bit conflicted about talking to you about retrospective compliance because, of course, we all hope that you get it right um, at an earlier stage and you don't have to consider well, what happens when it all goes wrong. But it is important for you to know that the higher courts are very reticent to say that a breach of the public sector quality duty is somehow a trump card. It really isn't for all the reasons that Rucci has um, eloquently explained. Um, so, well, what does the court do when it all goes wrong? Well, it looks to see um, whether you have complied now. So at the time of trial, looking at TM and Metropolitan Housing Trust, um, have you now complied with what was expected of you at an earlier stage? Have you in your witness statement, for example, for trial, had you regard to the need 
to treat a disabled tenant more favorably than a non-disabled tenant? And what are the factors you've taken into account? And if you do that in a conscientious and full manner um, at trial in your witness statement, even if you haven't done it previously in the equality impact assessment that I've referred to um, before, then the court will have some uh, sympathy with that position. And so, so long as it is genuine and reliable, uh, and not some sort of ex post facto retrofit, um, uh, which will be obvious to everybody upon reading uh, such a witness statement, um, then the court will give that um, will give that weight and will ultimately conclude that um, the duty has been uh, discharged. Now, Ricci's case of Taylor and Slough um, Borough Council, just on the previous slide, sorry, um, is also very important um, because it sets out in terms uh, that a breach of the PSED um, uh, can be cured. So the judge says he does not accept that an argument that a breach cannot be cured, at least in the circumstances of this case, by subsequent compliance with the duty. Um, so where there is no prospective compliance, it is absolutely possible to demonstrate at trial uh, that you have complied, albeit belatedly, but that it is genuine compliance as opposed to simple box ticking. So Ricci's case is really important from that perspective because it is a very clear exposition from the Court of Appeal saying uh, that there is no trump card and that you are able to comply at a later stage even if you don't comply when you should have done. So moving to the next slide. Um, well, it, it, what happens even if there is a breach of the PSED and even if there is no uh, late compliance? Well, even then, the court is able to draw an analogy with um, Section 31-2A of the Senior Courts Act 81. Now, it's important to say that that section is not of direct application um, to situations where you are defending um, possession proceedings. Um, that section is aimed squarely at judicial review proceedings and the question um, for the court will be is it highly likely but for the breach that the outcome would have been the same and that's what the court asks in judicial review proceedings when considering relief um, but it's also important uh, in the context of say possession proceedings for the court to take the same approach by analogy because again it's the same point that we were hammering home earlier it is a question of substance and not form. So um, for that reason, uh, cases like Forward and Oldwick and Lord Justice Longmore at the bottom uh, of the screen uh, reiterates that just because there is a breach of the PSED, it does not necessarily follow that your possession claim uh, fails. And indeed, quite the opposite, um, the court will be rigorous to scrutinize um, whether that breach uh, was substantive, would it have made a, a, a material difference or was it simply a breach of form? Um, I unfortunately have to go to the door to collect an urgent brief which has just arrived, so I'll let Ruchi just take over for a moment. Hi, um, I'm just going to hold for while, and, uh, while Andy Ryan comes back. Uh, I'm just going to take a quick look at the questions that have been asked so, for, so far to see if there's anything um, that I can address there. I think Andy and Ryan have very efficiently answered these already. Um, so if you'll just bear with us for one second. And Ryan's back already. <laughs> Sorry about that. I did warn Ricci beforehand that that might happen. Um, I was expecting an urgent set of papers and I just knew Sod's Law that it would arrive as I was talking to all of you. So I, I am very sorry about that. Um, now, Section 31-2A, yep. So the takeaway points are that it's not of direct application. It's generally about judicial review and public law decision-making. But um, in cases like Forward and Oldwick, it's clear that the courts apply it by analogy. So it's an important, tool to have up your sleeve because the courts will consider um, whether even if the duty was complied with it would have had um, some kind of substantive uh, impact on on the case. Um, so that's what I want to say about that and then finally Luton and uh, Dordana. Um, so even if there is a PSED breach 
And even if the court carries out its by analogy section 31 to a assessment, that may still not be the end. Because of course, what the court then has to go on to do is to consider all the factors that go to the reasonableness in a discretionary grounds case um, of uh, an order for possession. And that isn't limited to an assessment of what was known about the individual's disability at the time that possession proceedings were instituted, but it is a, a, a comprehensive assessment of what reasonableness requires at the date of trial. Um, so the message from uh, Durdana and the cases on the previous slide is that even if there's been a breach of the PSED, even if the court has uh, concluded that Section 31 2A can be applied by analogy and that there, was, there would be no substantive difference to the outcome where the, the duty to be complied with, there is then a further step of actually persuading the court that even taking into account what's happened up until the date of trial, it is nevertheless reasonable uh, for the court to make an order for possession. So those are some of the things that um, I wanted to talk to you about in terms of retrospective compliance, to give you some comfort that just because your clients don't comply doesn't mean it's the, the end of the road and the courts are very astute uh, to saying that the breach of the PSED is not a trump card. Um, and now I think we have um, 10 minutes for questions. So I shall open it to the floor. Yes, I, th I think, Ryan, we've, um, uh, as Richard said, we had some questions which you and I have, have looked at as we've gone through and Richard was doing her piece. Um, by the way, that's Oli Gunnar Solskjaer, just in case anyone's asking, like, like Ryan did. I had no idea, I must have. Um, but um, uh, that's my fault. Uh, but if people do have questions, please use the chat function because I, I suspect you're automatically muted. So you may be kind of shouting at the screen now. Please use the chat function. Um, I think what I would say, encapsulating everything that's been dealt with, uh, particularly by uh, Rucci and Ryan, is it's something not to be scared of. It really is something not to be scared of. It's frustrating, but it, remember, it's also probably allied, certainly at first instance, with many other defences as well. It's not the only defence. It sometimes gets to be the only defence on appeal, like happened with Powell, for example. But remember, Powell started off with um, a trial as to whether, in fact, there'd been a breach at all uh, of the suspended possession order in the normal way. It started off with allegations of discrimination, etc. cetera. Um, so it doesn't at first instance, and it shouldn't at first instance worry people. Uh, and also just to say in response to one of the questions which I answered, be a little bit careful about, um, and I know this it happens in the criminal law as well with some cases, about giving the defence an opportunity to improve their case by telling them why um, their assertion of the PSED is hopeless. If you're representing tenant lawyers, of course, put your fingers in your ears now. Uh, it's probably better sometimes to save it for trial, if that really isn't adding anything to the case, if it really is a hopeless um, argument, then you might as well leave it to trial, to be quite frank. And there's no point being pedantic and, and seeking a strike out of that paragraph of the defence or seeking further particulars. If there is a genuine issue there, which you think you know could be interesting, that may be when you ask a, a part uh, 18. Um, Andy, I think uh, Amita Makrani has asked whether one should write to um, tenants and ask them if they believe that they have a protected characteristic that's relevant, um, because it, it might not be obvious from the council's records. Now, um, I'll perhaps kick this off and then um, hand it over. As Andy's head movement's indicating, it's a double-edged sword because of course the council um, uh, cannot be expected uh, and it's set out in the Equality Act itself to take into account something that it had no knowledge of or it couldn't be reasonably expected to know. I suppose the issue is that um, if individuals are in social housing, quite a lot of the time they will be uh, there because they fell within one of the priority need categories and that can quite often be because they suffer from a disability, for example. Um, and so perhaps on one view, the council should be on notice that because of the nature of the tenants that they deal with, it's more likely that they might have disabilities than the general population. And so it can't hurt to proactively make the inquiry and front load it. Um, it might also help to proactively make the inquiry because, of course, um, they may say something uh, that reflects the true position before they go and uh, see a solicitor who, who might ex post facto, 
um, uh, try and achieve some kind of disability diagnosis later down the line, not saying that um, they're necessarily acting inappropriately in doing so, but that, that is something that can happen and it's quite useful to have a contemporaneous note to show, well actually before you instituted proceedings you made inquiries about um, a disability uh, and were told from the tenant themselves that they don't in fact suffer from one. So um, it, it is a double-edged sword, I'll see, see what Andy and Rucci think. I mean, personally speaking, um, I, I think what Rucci had said about a good officer complying with the PSCD is, is really what it's about. And I don't think it's a good idea to start saying, by the way, here are the nine protected characteristics. Which one do you suffer from or which one do you have? Um, you know, because, for example, you know, everyone has the protected characteristics of sex, um, you know, but it may be irrelevant, you know, what sex the person is. Uh, but in other cases, it may be fairly obvious that that is the reason why, for example, they're receiving problems from the neighbour and there may be particular issues there. Um, so I wouldn't go out of my way to do that. And I would hope a good landlord would know uh, the protected characteristic. And in any event, once they are made aware, they can then, as has been said throughout this session by particularly Ruchi and Ryan, um, they can then deal with it. Uh, can I also, at the same time, before Rucci um, uh, comments on it, just also say very quickly in relation to two questions on, on the um, question and answer function, PSED isn't accommodation related. It's not about whether you've got a secure tenancy or a private tenancy or a whatever. It's about uh, a landlord either be, being a public authority like a local housing authority or exercising a public function, like in most instances, probably, and I underline probably, housing associations. Um, so, for example, just being a, a licensee doesn't mean the PSED doesn't apply. If, you're, if your landlord uh, of that license is a local authority or housing association, it may well apply. Uh, same with supported accommodation. Uh, and there may be issues of funding, as I've answered previously. And just very quickly at the end, um, uh, the question about disclosing any pro forma uh, of the kind that um, uh, Ryan was talking about being helpful to have, uh, yes, it should be a public document. It should be part of uh, the documents that you would disclose in the normal course of events. It's not meant to be an internal secret document. It's meant to be the product of your consideration of the case and sometimes your discussions with the tenant or, or the household member. Um, so, um, yes, I, I, I think um, it can be disclosed. There's nothing uh, strange about it. Um, I wouldn't see it as a get-out-of-jail card because the reality is whatever you say, uh, to a tenant lawyer, in my experience, they're still going to plead the PSED. Um, uh, and that's, yeah, not no disrespect, they're obviously acting on behalf of their clients and trying to do the best uh, job possible, but it's not probably going to be the thing uh, that, that stop uh, that happening. Um, and uh, just finally, um, pre-action protocol letter. Um, yes, it's always a good idea to talk to the tenant, of course. Um, and of course, it's always a good idea to comply um, with a warning that if they don't behave or if they don't stop you know defaulting on their arrears or damaging the property or whatever the problem is um the local authority or the housing association is considering going for possession and getting their feedback um and if it's a mandatory ground you ought to be complying with part three of the social um housing possession claim protocol anyway so i'm, I'm a big fan of protocol letters um and i don't see any reason why one shouldn't be sent out so i think that's a good idea so i'll shut up now and uh, pass to rucci um, thanks, Andy. Just on that last point, um, just reading the question, um, that last question about pre-action protocol letter, um, I'm not sure what's intended there, but it does say, would that suffice? Um, and that's, I think, one part of it, but I don't think uh, that would be the sort of, uh, if, well, it depends from case to case, as I said, it's it's very fact specific, but um, if there are, you know, if you do that and if uh, the tenant for whatever reason doesn't respond and doesn't, you know, doesn't even respond, doesn't attend any um, sort of meeting that you've set up, but that there are other sort of red flags or warnings in any given case as to why you think that actually the tenant might have a disability, in that kind of case, you might be expected to go one step further and try and make um, some other inquiries. But um, but other than that, uh, where there's no possible way that you could have been expected to know about uh, a tenant's uh, disability, for example, um, the courts don't expect you to go further. And that just ties back to, um, I think, the previous question we had about whether you should write to tenants um, you know, about their protected characteristics if, you, if you're not sure if they, if they have one that's relevant to your decision 
um, regarding possession. Um, again, just, you know, I, I don't, just echoing what the others have said, I don't think that's necessary. And in fact, that's something that's made quite clear in the Patrick decision, where the court says, well, actually, if you, you know, if there's nothing to suggest that they have a disability and that there's no you know, reasonable reason why you would have been alerted to it, then actually um, you can't just expect um, officers to sort of just sit down in a total vacuum and come up with hypothetical scenarios of what, you know, may or may be relevant in any given case. That's certainly not a standard that the courts will um, will hold officers to. So I think you can um, feel fairly um comfortable with just proceeding on the basis of the information that's actually provided to you and on the basis of any reasonable inquiries you've made where, as I say, there are any warnings or red flags. I am just uh, looking to see if there are any more questions. I don't think there are. I mean, I um, think um, because I need to get to court. <laughs> so I, I won't leave my, my colleagues and friends in the lurch. Um, can I just thank everyone for attending? Um, you know where we are anyway. Um, hope you've enjoyed it. What I do know is that these um, slides do go on YouTube eventually. Um, and I think we do send out um, the slides, but I'll check with that, uh, with those who kind of run things to see if that is the case. But I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any constructive feedback, please feel free to email either Chambers or ourselves individually. Uh, and thank you very much for attending. It's much appreciated. Thank you all. Thank you.